Welcome to Buy the Bywater, a podcast on the Megaphonic Network. I'm Ned Raggett. I'm Oriana Schwint. I'm Jared Pekachak. And we're here to talk about all things J.R.R. Tolkien. His work, his inspirations and impact, creative interpretations in other media, languages, lore, ripoffs, parodies, anything we think is interesting. Thanks for joining us. Hello and welcome to the 34th episode of By the Bywater. Great to have you back with us. It is wonderful to be back. It's a new year and we're all hiding inside, avoiding Omicron or however you pronounce it. Please stay well. <laughs> at this point, we're not going to, you if know, you can. at this point, it's beyond just judgment. We know people are getting it with things that just. Mm, mm. Do your best, <laughs> but please take all appropriate steps. That's all we ask. So uh, <laughs> we'll, we'll please, get through this. Please, please. Yeah, this first week was of, of 2022 was a real struggle. <laughs> it was. Yeah. I was honestly exhausted at the end of it. And yep. and not just, and physically too, again, to give you everyone a slight update of my condition, I'm out of the sling, but the arm is uh, still going through physical therapy and will for some time yet. So, eh, but I can work it. So that's, that's kind of nice. I will say before we progress further that uh, I have been spending a lot of time listening to, I think I mentioned this before, but just to get a little more detail, Andy Serkis's readings of the Hobbit and Lord of the Rings all this time. In fact, I just finished up a, uh, the two towers this morning. Um, I don't know if we'll ever necessarily do an episode on that. Uh, basically, it's very good. You should listen to it. Um, and if I can note something uh, particular about it, it's that, uh, of course, you get him doing Gollum one last time. This time, all the Gollum lines as written and appropriate, full the way down the line, So, uh, which is good. So none of the more random bits. Uh, but also to hear how his choices are in terms of portraying the other characters and uh, the accents and approaches he takes. He does not clone his castmates, for the most part. He comes up with his own individual approach which makes it more its own thing. Yeah. Um, and I will just end with that. So there, recommendation. So, But we got through the holiday season. How about you guys? Yeah. 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 <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> we survived. I, I, spent, I spent the crisp, I like started writing uh, this spec script that we have had assigned to us in the program I am doing. And, you know, I, I like started writing on Christmas, spent the week between Christmas and New Year's basically just knocking that puppy out in, in a, my creative juices are running a little low right now, honestly. <laughs> yeah. It takes it out of you. Mm. The, you know, the plague. Yep. Yep. But yeah, with well, on that note, we'll try and recharge in different ways, and we'll do that by having a little bit of news, even though there's not much. So, Jared, if you could please go ahead and take it away. So, official news on the Amazon series has been utterly absent for the holiday season. You know, likely not surprising since they were also focused on wrapping up the first season release for the Wheel of Time. Um, there's been rumors of leaks and the like, but we're content to let that slide beyond noting that with less than eight months to go until its debut on Labor Day weekend, God, that's coming up. Um, they're probably well aware that something official probably needs to surface in the near future here. Beyond that, there's not much to note outside of Celebration Soul King's birthday, which was the third, right? I think so. I think. Yes. Yeah. Um, endlessly recycled rumors in general, and one pretty good story about a set of photos of Edith and J.R.R. himself taken by a professional photographer and friend in the 1960s, which sold for thousands of pounds. Hey, why not? <laughs> ah, content. Just don't turn them into NFTs. That's all we ask. Oh, Please. No. Did you see why that? would you say that? <laughs> Sorry. Did you see that, you know, non-fungible Tolkien's? Yes. Um, did you see that um, <laughs> thing where the Tolkien Society was trying to, like, sue somebody for copyright infringement because they bought a photo and somebody yeah. posted a scan of it and they were like, that's ours. And it was like, no, it, you, you own, like, you own the print. You don't yeah. own the Oh I, my God. I didn't make heads or tails of it. It was one of the things. Should so I bring weird. this up? It was so weird. <laughs> yeah. I don't know. What do you gain by being litigious over something like that exactly? What is that yeah. really in the spirit of the man or the work? I don't, I don't, I don't think, think so. It is. Uh, it's, um, it's all IT. It's all IP, uh, rather. It's all content. Oh, it's all. No. <laughs> No, <laughs> no, I agree. No, <laughs> yeah. we are fighting the long defeat. I'm sorry. We are. <laughs> Which one oh, of us is no. the first? <laughs> Oh God! <laughs> oh dear. So uh, yes, uh, we uh, we'll throw in a link to the uh, to the story, even though it is the Daily Mail about those uh, photographs and things like. So it's actually pretty good, and I've seen some of them before, but not all of them. And it's it just a, a nice story. story. Yeah, it's a good story, nice set of shots, and uh, you know, hey, you know, just a little, little extra things right there. But in terms of something uh, extra, yeah, we'll just again note Wheel of Time did wrap up. Ending episode was. Mm, 
you know, we'll see where it goes, uh, I guess, is where it is. So they had some they had some difficulties shooting that last episode, apparently. So, yeah, you know, wish them wish them the best of luck in, in the coming. There is an incredible uh, video of of Rosamund Pike uh, <laughs> that she posted where she is waiting for to do an appearance on Jimmy Kimmel Live and disembowels a pineapple, kind of. It's so good. It's so good. We will put Ned. That's going to be in the show notes. Just I'm make I'm I'm willing it to happen. We are yes. One other thing too, I get to gleefully note is that uh, my cohort here uh, was not aware of the other set of behind the scenes yeah. of documentaries made oh, for yeah. the Peter Jackson films. Uh, to basically, since I realize that maybe not everyone is aware of that, let me point that out. Most people are probably familiar with the very extensive, very f- formally done with the talking head setup and all that of the uh, for the behind the scenes of the three main films. Uh, got a lot of attention. Still, kind of like almost the pinnacle example of. Uh, how that worked uh, almost like a holdover now from the from the you know high peak uh, DVD era mm-hmm. um, but uh, that there is another set by Costa Botes a uh, New Zealand filmmaker who's friends with uh, with uh, Fran and Peter from way back and had worked with them before uh, that were a lot of the behind the scenes footage from those documentaries was first taken and he assembled his own cut of strictly just raw on site footage from the shooting of the films uh, called essentially the making of Lord of the Rings or something like that, covering all three films in total about six hours. These are available if you know where to look for them. Uh, they uh, they ended up uh, on separate DVD issues in the mid uh, mid two thousands or late two thousands, and they are on the Blu Ray set that came out in the early twenty tens. So if you have that, you have those. But they are also available on YouTube, at least for now. If you haven't seen them, it's as I said about six hours all told, five and a half six hours. But take the time; you're going to see a lot of footage that you've never seen before. Some random amazing skits, all sorts of great stuff. It, it's so worth your time. So that is our little addendum from, from the last episode, I guess is what it is with uh, talking about that. Um, but yeah, so now you know. We'll throw links in the show notes, of course. Um, but the other thing... No, there is no other thing. It's time to move on. we got stuff to talk about. we got a big old essay to talk about. And oh my god, it's so long. It's, it's, it's so, so long. So long. Uh, but it's, it's not even as long as Lord of the Rings. Come on, guys. No, I'm teasing. I'm teasing. Alright, yeah. so with that said, here we go. Moving into our main topic. Of Tolkien's many works, Tree and Leaf remains unique in that, from everything published during his lifetime, it consists of two wholly separate pieces in two different modes, a revised version of a lengthy academic lecture, and a brief short story with overt but also unusual religious elements. The first, of fairy stories, remains one of his most famous essays, and arguably the one with the greatest insight into how he perceived both his own work and argued for the genre in which was most closely associated. It's been anthologized numerous times, and was given a detailed expanded edition in 2014, edited by Verlin Flieger and Douglas A. Anderson. The second, Leaf by Niggle, is one of Tolkien's most atypical stories, anthologized here and there beyond its appearance in Tree and Leaf, and receiving its own separate standalone publication in 2016, with a short accompanying essay by Tom Shippey. Tolkien himself spoke in the original preface to Tree and Leaf about how the two were connected, quote, by the symbols of Tree and Leaf, and by both touching in different ways on what is called in the essay, sub-creation, end quote. It's been noted more than once that Smith of Wooten Major, which was written and published a few years later after Tree and Leaf, which originally came out in 1964, would have been an even more appropriate pairing of story to essay. But even so, it's an interesting pairing whose separate elements do deserve attention. At almost three times the length of Leaf by Niggle, On Fairy Stories carries the bulk of the book. Originally written for a 1939 presentation at the University of St. Andrews as an entry in an annual series on the life and work of Scottish folklorist and researcher Andrew Lang, it was first revised and formally published in 1947 as part of a collection in honor of Tolkien's friend, the author Charles Williams, one of the Inklings. It was then further revised and published in its final form for Tree and Leaf. The essay is many things, a discussion of the origins of fairy stories and what the term even means, as distinct from other varieties of imaginative literature, a reflection on the impact of comparative philology and the research done in collecting folk tales throughout the world in the 19th century, and a defense against the idea, espoused by Lang himself and many others, that fairy stories as such were strictly for children and childish contexts, 
and much more besides. Contemporary accounts of the lecture indicate it was fairly weighty fare to start with, and its revised final version, it reflects much of the research and experience that Tolkien had in both his chosen academic fields, as well as his wider areas of interest. While Tolkien very happily and passionately shared thoughts in his own legendarium in his many letters and other, in and other contexts, in On Fairy Stories, he sets that aside, perhaps judging that his previous lecture, A Secret Vice, on his passion for languages, had covered that angle, to reflect more on the state of the field in a general philosophical and academic sense rather than as, say, a branch of publishing and marketing. This is due to the obvious reason that he himself essentially pioneered that possibility without intending it. And as such, it's also a fascinating way to consider how his preferred mode of creative expression then had almost nothing in the way of institutional and investing interest, whether from publishers, but also movie and game stu TV studios, gaming firms, and more besides, that's resulted since. At the time of the lecture, The Hobbit had been published just the year before and had made a notable splash, and he'd only just begun to sketch out the earliest drafts of The Lord of the Rings, but well before he developed it into the far more ambitious project it turned out to be in the end. In a real sense, On Fairy Stories is not only an analysis of the past, but a case for the present and the future, something heavily indicated by his in-depth consideration of what escapism means and how it functions. In contrast, initially, Leaf by Niggle almost seems like a Philip or even an add-on, the more so due to the circumstances of its original publication. It first appeared in early 1945 in an issue of the Dublin Review, a Catholic publication, based in London for what it's worth, that at the time had been in business for over a hundred years, a well-established venue for writers of the faith. Little surprise that the deeply faithful Catholic that Tolkien was would be aware of it, and even less so that the story might find a receptive audience there. While Tolkien spoke about how The Lord of the Rings was to his mind not merely a Christian but a Catholic text, Leaf by Niggle is even more clearly a very Catholic work, as close to an approach as one of C.S. Lewis's stories as he ever got. Though at the same time remarkably different stylistically from that author in turn, and unlike Farmer Giles of Ham with its learned parson, Leaf by Niggle is more like Swith of Wooten Major in that it features no organized church while it is almost the sole story Tolkien wrote set in what is more or less meant to be our world as we know it, or at least the UK of the mid-20th century, if in a broad and intentionally unspecific fashion. The story tells of an artist living on his own in the countryside, Niggle, who grows obsessed with painting a vision of a tree in a beautiful landscape, where his attention focuses on the tree, and even more specifically its leaves, all while knowing in the back of his mind there is a specific journey that he must undergo that he cannot escape from, However, he regularly, if sometimes grouchily, has to break from his task and contemplation of his plans to host others or assist them with their needs, in particular a neighbor, Parrish, who, due to a crippled leg, cannot carry out various tasks he and his wife regularly have to address. Eventually, after time spent trying to organize help for Parrish during rain and flooding, Nigel is compelled to take his journey, leading to what turns out to be apparent years and years of hard anonymous work, but one day, a transformative step based on his actions leads him to experiencing his tree and landscape directly, and much more besides. Meanwhile, back where he used to live, his name and memory fade, with only a scrap of painting, a beautiful leaf from his tree, to temporarily gain even minimal attention. We'll go some more into this story in the fairly evident sense about how Tolkien viewed both his faith and his own considered measure of what he had created later in the episode, but on fairy stories understandably deserves much attention first, and so it's time to open up the floor. And boy, that was a heavy read, wasn't it there? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I feel like it was not great that I kind of left this uh, essay until this week to read when we were all struggling like a yeah. lot. Because mm -hmm. I struggled to get through this, uh, and I, I think that is mostly a me issue. Uh, no, I struggle oh, okay, so much with fairy stories. <laughs> it's it's dense, is what it's it is. It's really dense, yeah. really abstract, and I think that I kind of have trouble with some of it. That's why I like never got into critical theory of any kind, because I would try to read and just be like, I don't really know what anyone's talking about. And this is not nearly like as dense as, as, as that kind kind of reading um but it is it, it it is funny and i but i did enjoy you know uh weird random the the banana the bananas, the bananas yeah. uh the banana peel like i found it harder to read in some ways than critical theory because he keeps getting distracted mm -hmm. by what he's by the texture of the essay itself in a way yeah. like he keeps going off on like talking about i don't know leaves or whatever and it's like <laughs> what it 
is it, what is your point? Is it the leaves? What are we talking about now? So I had to, I had to, I read it once all the way through and was like, I don't think I got any of that. So I had to sit back down like literally last night with like post notes in a notebook and go, okay, so this part is talking about this. This, this is his point. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I feel like uh, what doesn't, I bet this was much easier to absorb as an actual lecture. Mm. Personally, oh, I that's, would have hated it as a lecture. I mean, <laughs> you know, that's just me, but I, I think, I think I, my learning style is a bit, leans a bit more towards the auditory uh, in in this kind of context. And I think I would have had an easier time because it is funny, like Ned, you're talking about just sort of defining fairy stories. And I, I did he, <laughs> it, 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 it kind of felt as though he kind of talked around it for 40 pages. Uh, I mean, it, it's really, it, it, it's a, it's a lot. Uh, I am, I'm now holding up for, for uh, my compatriots to see again. You guys can't see it because you're not seeing yeah. the video part of this, but uh, the 2014 edition of on fairy stories, which provides a lot more oh, that's in, a lot. In, yeah. in, in the, in the best exhaustive way that uh, Tolkien scholarship can uh, unsurprisingly many manuscripts and many sort of like, you know, layers of composition to this, but also because it was written up in various contexts over different decades. And by the time of yeah. its final, publication, um, Tolkien was in a much different position. Uh, as I mentioned in my intro, of course, he's, uh, he's he's only just made an initial wider splash beyond academic circles thanks to The Hobbit. And uh, the uh, it, it's funny, the idea, I, I would actually kind of agree with Oriana that it probably did probably go down a little bit better initially as a lecture, partially because he had tailored it for his audience. Yeah. His original introduction was uh, much more of a, along the lines of, well, it's kind of ridiculous for an English guy to come up here to uh, Scotland and talk about uh, Scottish folklore, you probably know more about the subject than I do. It's 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 not quite that, but it has it has an undertone <laughs> I of that. No big city ethologist. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> exactly. So that sort of thing, and uh, and and there's other things there, but he very much did develop and and change this. So as a result, we are seeing its density and its its apparent bleh, of structure is uh, is reflective of the fact that he he never really. S- started over from scratch with it. Mm-hmm. If he, if the original lecture and maybe a different piece uh, that was written in 64 had, had to be a case we could compare one to the other, we'd probably look for that. And I forget, I think it's in the uh, Flieger Anderson volume as well, that they make a distinction uh, between essentially on fairy stories and the introduction and the, uh, both the introduction and the essentially the failed introduction <laughs> as well. It, that's involved with Smith, with Smith and Wooten major where, mm-hmm. The failed introduction for the uh, for uh, for the golden key for Church McDonald's golden key led mm, to yeah. creation of Smith and Wound Ranger and all that. And again, both arguably are looking at subjects along the lines of what's happening in on fairy stories as well. The idea of you know what is how do we define fairy? What is it? And that's that's where the suggestion, the idea that had it been a little later, had the idea come a little later, pairing Smith and Wound Major with on fairy stories might have been a good idea. At the same time, it might have you know if you read the essay first, you, your head might fall off before you finally got <laughs> Smith and Major. So, so who knows? find yourselves <laughs> arguing with him in yes. your head? Oh my god, yes. <laughs> I think there's plenty to argue with. Go right ahead. What did you have problems with? Let's not we're not we're not here to take any of this as holy writ. What what's stuff left out of you? Oh uh, well he's there's part where he's talking about so one of his main threads is that fantasy is in some ways the purest art because it relies on the author creating an entirely illusory world for you to believe in. Mm -hmm. So a huge part of this art is the interplay between the author and the reader Mm -hmm. and this like convincing you as long as you're within the pages that this is real, which I think is great. But then he goes on to be like drama and painting and all these things. I get what his point is, but I don't think he's right. Like right. he brings up mm-hmm. Macbeth specifically as like the witches work on the page because you can picture them, but they don't work on stage because something like it's hard to pull them off in a way that looks cool or something like that. You're not because you're no longer imagining the fantastical. You are seeing it and therefore it is it's forcing you to see it a certain way. Whereas in the realm of sort of archetype that fairy tales and fantasy work in, you're only, you're seeing it in a way that's intensely personal. So having the dictatorial voice of the painter or the dramatist or whatever forcing you to see things a certain way is like somehow wrong. And I was sitting there going, I like I know maybe this is a problem for you, 
but I feel like it's not a problem for everybody. <laughs> mm-hmm. I, yeah, I absolutely thought it kind of weird that his, his bone to pick with drama, uh, was honestly kind of bizarre to me. <laughs> yeah. Mm-hmm. You know, drama is naturally hostile to fantasy, and he was he's talking about at one point, thus, if you prefer drama to literature, as many literary critics plainly do, or form your critical theories primarily from dramatic critics, or even from capital D drama, you are apt to misunderstand pure story making and to constrain it to the limitations of stage plays. You are, for instance, likely to prefer characters, even the basest and dullest, to things. Very little about trees as trees can be got into a play, Mm -hmm. Um, which is like as someone who is, you know, professionally telling stories for a living, it feels utterly strange to me for someone who loves telling stories to say that care like it it is it's good for a story actually to, to concentrate on the characters and for that to be, there's like this saying in TV that story comes from character. Like Mm -hmm. it's, 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 it's so strange to me that he says this, but it also kind of tracks, uh, given, given his way of storytelling and some of the characters that may or may not come across as a little thin and sometimes, and, But what's really funny is that he does create, he does make a tree into a character in the Lord of the Rings. I was like, man, come on. (laughs) (laughs) I, that was one part where I was like, when he started talking, he had me, I was there for it. Like fantasy literature and drama are different art forms and require different critical approaches. Right. I'm with you. That's fine. That's fine. But then like this weird, he swerves into you know, oh, you're going to prefer character to trees. And it's like, I, okay, I... Preferring character to things is good in storytelling. I don't know what you're talking about, man. Like, as somebody whose storytelling is very Mm thing-focused at times, I get what he's doing. I think he's mistaking the specific for the universal in this case. (laughs) Yeah. A lot of it was so valuable. And then every so often, he goes off on, like, this is only true if you're specifically thinking about Tolkien's work. Yeah. Mm, mm, mm. Which he obviously is. So. Right. And I, that was part of what made it hard was because I was like, I kept following his train of thought and then it kind of jumps the track into the woods or whatever. And then I was like, okay, yes, this illuminates your thinking. Mm, right. Mm, 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 but it doesn't illuminate fairy story. <laughs> right. 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 Yeah, no, there, there's yeah, plenty to unpack on that. Uh, you know, I'm gonna th- keep throwing in here, but uh, but as as you say, and maybe sort of sort of you know dwell on a point here that uh, that uh, that I kind of have mentioned in, in the intro and is worth not uh, kneeling down again is the idea too uh, that uh, that Tolkien is fighting a battle that no longer exists or rather has been transmuted, namely yeah, the yeah, idea yeah. that fantasy is strictly quote unquote kid stuff. It's right. It's clearly a, a, a burr up his butt. <laughs> is there no other way to put it? And and understandably so. And the fact that he is doing so um, at a lecture series honoring Lang, who through his uh, colored, as they put it, because they're all base colors, the fairy fairy books that uh, were huge and popular, like about a dozen or so. Uh, they uh, they sort of were uh, foundational late Victorian uh, collections of various fairy stories elsewhere, uh, put in one place. And while uh, Lang himself was not entirely a sentimentalist, thankfully. He was just enough of a sentimentalist that the success of them mm-hmm. still drove him nuts, <laughs> clearly. It sort of drove Tolkien nuts, I should say. Um, and uh, and again, there's much more in the weeds discussion about uh, this and another another critic by the name of Max Mueller uh, who uh, he uh, he had problems with as well. That can be dealt with in sort of the side readings. I won't go into that there. But he definitely was he basically is spending a lot of time basically saying it's not just fluttery flitter bits it's not yeah. just you know, yeah. Peter Pan, and he's his, his choice of language itself is, uh, dare I say, intriguingly loaded. I mean, right almost from the get go. So this is this is from this is literally just after the introduction when he's basically saying, "What is a fairy story?" Yeah. and he goes into that and basically talks about the idea about th- fairies being diminutive size, and that that gets him going pretty fired <laughs> up. Oh, that riles him up, <laughs> and he's right. He's I mean, right. Yeah. yeah, totally. So totally. I hate that kind of fairy story too. I mean. 
Yeah, so here, here's a quote from that. Of old, there were indeed some inheritance of fairy that were small, though hardly diminutive, but smallness was not characteristic of that people as a whole. The diminutive being, elf or fairy, is, I guess, in England, largely a sophisticated product of literary fancy. And then he gets a little more loaded here. It is perhaps not unnatural that in England, the land where the love of the delicate and the fine is often reappeared in art, fancy should in this manner turn towards the dainty and diminutive, as in France. It went to court and put on powder and diamonds. Yet I suspect <laughs> that this flower and butterfly minuteness was also a product of rationalization, which transformed the glamour of Elfland into mere finesse and invisibility into a fragility that could hide in a cowslip or shrink behind a blade of glass. And then he goes on later to complain about uh, Drayton's uh, poem Nymphidia from the 1600s and saying, quote, is one answer of that long line of flower fairies and fluttering sprites with antennae that I so disliked as a child and which my children in their turn detested. <laughs> <laughs> I wonder I wonder why they detested that. Like I wonder where they could have possibly have gotten that idea from. It, it came it came down the pike. But what's interesting of course is that and this is something again that the critical edition of this essay on its own goes into is that at this point in time Tolkien is sort of fighting against complaining about something that was evident in the Hobbit mm-hmm. where there is that little element of sort of like there there pat on the head and this thanks to the narrator in particular and some other things along the way something which he hadn't quite yet broken through yet to figure out what to do. In mm-hmm. writing Lord of the Rings, because at that point he was still very much he hadn't he hadn't created the Return of the Shadow chapter yet. In essence, you know the initial drafts of Lord of the Rings had happened. Frodo was off on an adventure, but Strider was still Trotter, who was a Hobbit, you know, and things yeah. like that. It hadn't quite it hadn't quite connected yet. He hadn't quite uh, you know made that particular leap. Of course, then again, we are reading the revised version of the essay, so now it's sort of like at that point most people are reading it. It's in a much different context, and that's that's important as well. His his love of capitalizing things to make it important, like the thing, <laughs> throughout is sort of like, well, not everyone agrees with that, and I'm not too sure what you're talking about. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it is like it is totally the the only way to really read this and digest it is 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 by like really absorbing and using that lens of like he's not Don Quixote, you know, tilting it at windmills the for him this is a giant um but you know what's so interesting to me is throughout like he keeps he he talks about elves all the time mm-hmm. and i'm so curious if and if people in 1939 knew what the hell he was talking i guess the hobbit had come out and so everyone would kind of take that as a reference i'm i'm guessing to his own elves because i don't know did people just go around talking about elves all yeah. the time and... i mean it was they were still because like that's the oldest english term for this kind yeah. of being yeah fairy is a i think a french mm-hmm. word. yeah yeah so he's he's very i i, I he's obviously thinking of his own elves at yeah. times, I, but like mm. i think he's very consciously rejecting the term fairy for these beings mm-hmm. right. because he's trying to pull things back towards the anglo-saxon and away from the more generalized european yeah thing that was going on yeah so it's like he'll talk about fairy as a place or fairy stories but when he's talking about fairies they're always elves right? yeah it's interesting, too, to get a real sense. This is something that isn't necessarily surprising, but sometimes it's sort of like, oh, yeah, right, that you know, Tolkien is aware of these fairly broad patterns and other authors and other contexts that he references and puts into, uh, puts into the stories. Uh, so uh, the philology, for instance, uh, was obviously his field, but um, also this sense about how philology and folklore studies were very carefully intertwined. Um, the sense of like he's referencing this story uh, and, and he references the tale of the two brothers that's an ancient egyptian short story yeah. or a story things like that we're sort of like wait egypt but it's like okay well why wouldn't he know about that necessarily if he had researched this thing it's one of those things you get a sense that even though it's a pretty eurocentric uh, thing that he's looking at you know he you know if he had pulled in references to like say you know other you know uh, whether it's from africa or whether it's from asia or things like that that would have been like oh wow you know hey you know, it was you know, interesting that he placed in in the essay it's quote red indians whereas mm-hmm. yeah. yes. we would say either native or indigenous uh americans it is interesting that he like places them as sort of just below uh the sort of northern european ancient fairy stories 
actually, I wish you had said more about that. Like, what's your experience with them? Like, actual, like, Native American folk tales. Do you have much? It it almost seemed to me like he was thinking more in terms of, like, stories about Native Americans. Mm, Yeah. Which... I it didn't you know he didn't expand on it. I have no idea, but right. the vibe I got was like I don't know reports from the frontier kind of thing. Mm-hmm. Yeah, he, he did talk about liking liking to shoot a bow and arrow and wishing yeah. he could. Yeah. So I, I guess maybe it was just. It was interesting the the way in a few places, one specific place where he kind of pushes back against ideas of like quote primitive man. Yeah. Unquote, yes. Mm-hmm. Which I wouldn't ever have expected. Right. <laughs> I'm mm-hmm. so happy he did. Like, yeah, what he's, he's referring to a thing that Andrew Lang says about, like, children basically being, like, simple folk who prefer fairy stories, just like their naked, savage forebears yeah. did or whatever. And and Tolkien's like, okay, children, first of all, are not, they're not just fools. But second of all, neither were primitive people. Like, it's like yeah. <laughs> they had history and geography and all that, too. That's how we have it. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And I was like, oh, okay. Yeah. Yeah, this the sense that the sense that he is basically arguing. I forget the exact the wording's in here. I thought it was just really good. Uh, the idea that you know, there's one thing to be sort of like, oh, hey, random tales, and aren't they kind of absurd? It's like, no, the further you sink into them, the further you actually get a sense from the inside out mm-hmm. of how society and how people function and what they conclude. And basically, that they are that doesn't make these that doesn't make their thoughts quote unquote primitive or unsophisticated. It's just a different collation of it, which is incredibly. You know, broad-minded, one might say, uh, for uh, for an author who, after all, in the end, very clearly indicates if this epilogue, it's sort of like, hey, look, I'm a believing Christian, this is what I think, but is still allowing for these interpretations to exist. And I think that also all boils down to, it's really interesting how he just touches on things like Carl Jung and stuff like that, uh, the idea of universal myths. He doesn't quite go to, you know, Joseph Campbell hasn't happened yet, um, mm. you know, that, that popularization post-war. Uh, when he originally writes this, and he doesn't really reference him uh, either at that point. He references a Campbell at one point, but the Campbell is a mid nineteenth century Scottish author mm-hmm. who collected uh, Scottish folk tales, so different different Campbell entirely. Um, but sort of that whole angle, how we have gotten the idea, especially popularized through, yes, of course, George Lucas and things like that. The idea is sort of like <laughs> this is the universal myth, and this is how we tell yeah. things, and that sort of strain of things. Tolkien is arguing from a much different point of view, and his the whole metaphor of the cauldron of story and the soup yeah. that he comes up with besides being a delicious metaphor is, <laughs> is 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 just is very interesting because he clearly is trying to I think he's allowing for both what he's maybe writing himself or trying to write um, in terms of his, at that point, more the legendarium than Lord of the Rings, of course, um, in its in its detail. Uh, but also just to just sort of allow for more possibility in a very universal sense. It's a very interesting it's a very interesting touch on something where he's not out of his framework and he has his preferences, but he's sort of like, this is here. You know, we, mm-hmm. we have this. And what does it mean? He, t- he t- spends a little time trying to delve into that. It's one of those things that can be a little abstruse, and you have to sort of pause and think, "What's he trying to say?" But, you know, but but you know, but still, he's he's still trying to basically, he's in his own in his own way, he's almost arguing. It's like, yeah, what makes us human? How do we end up like this? And why do we think this? And it's like eh, that's that's pretty bold. You can, probably can't solve it in a lecture, but at least you're trying. <laughs> One thing, I a passage that leapt out at me due to a different context, um, kind of, was an interesting one. This was prompted by a friend of mine's comment. Uh, he basically was making the case uh, separately, completely separately on Twitter the other day, talking about how horror itself can be a real lodestone, a centerpiece thing that can erupt into other genres and basically serve as some sort of connecting point to it. Mm-hmm. And the passage about horror, however brief, in on fairy stories is very interesting. So here is what he is talking about. He's uh, been referencing some of the old uh, Icelandic and Norse myths. And then he, then, he, uh, then he talks about, I'm guessing it's one of the grim tales. He says, The beauty and horror of the juniper tree, then he gives oh, the yeah. German title, with its exquisite and tragic beginning, the abominable cannibal stew, the gruesome bones, the gay and vengeful bird spirit coming out of a mist that rose from the tree, has remained with me since childhood, and yet always the chief flavor of that tale lingering in the memory was not beauty or horror, but distance and a great abyss of time, not even measurable by, and then 
some uh, German here, which I'm going to mispronounce badly, uh, Tue Tusen Jar. <laughs> Without the stew and the bones, which children are now too often spared in mollified versions of Grimm, that vision would have been largely have been lost. I do not think I was harmed by the horror in the fairy tale setting, out of whatever dark beliefs and practices of the past it may have come. Such stories now have a mythical or totally unanalyzable effect, an effect quite independent of the findings of comparative folklore, and one which you cannot spoil or explain. They open a door on other time. He capitalizes that, of course. And if we pass (laughs) through, though only for a moment, we stand outside our time, outside time itself, maybe. Again, pretty heady that he's putting in the one piece there, but it's a very interesting argument for something that, again, is not really talked about much in terms of Tolkien, but this idea of horror, body horror, something otherwise, and it's, you know, that description of the tale there is pretty pretty blunt is mm-hmm. one of those things sort of like how how does Tolkien address that and how does think about that and as he's allowing for it to creep in right here is something is sort of like basically as part of argument saying let your kids read what they want you know mm-hmm. is what it is which is a little drummed down I realize but that is these argument there is sort of like hey I read this I didn't screw me up you know which, <laughs> which is which is kind of vitally important I mean you know especially yeah. thinking about how horror functions has functioned as talked about in recent decades in a more modern sense and I will add too that I I was very delighted, honestly, to discover in the uh, in the extended uh, extended notes in the extended expanded edition that uh, one version or one manuscript of it had him referring at one point to something called "Ghost Stories of an Antiquary," which may not seem like much. That is, in fact, the original short story collection by M. R. James, one of my all time favorite English horror authors, hands mm-hmm. down. Oh, and so, so the good. fact that Tolkien knew his J- M. R. James makes me go like, really? <laughs> I want to delve into that some more. <laughs> that, that, yeah. That that, 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 that intrigues me greatly. So he at least was aware of it. So uh, there's something there. Um, I have one. I have another thought to sort of get to. But if do you, any other sort of things about the essay leap out for you guys? The, the horror, the horror element in, in, in particular, you know, my access to books was not really control. You know, I could just get stuff from the library and, and did, in fact, read a couple adult books that I absolutely shouldn't have. There was an R.L. Stein <laughs> book called The Snowman. I was seven years old mm-hmm. and The Snowman does some horrible, awful things with his nose to a person. And oh I was my. seven and like did not. <laughs> but, things I learned. <laughs> uh, so like that wasn't great, but most of the stuff that I read as a kid, my favorite part was either the, you know, kind of mild horror, the difficulty. Like I remember my favorite parts of, of a little princess where when she's like, you know, the little attic girl and is going yeah. through the difficult period and mm-hmm. um, ditto with like literally every other story. You know, my favorite part of the Baron and Luthien story is when there's like two of them. Like it's one is when Baron and Finrod are in the pit with the mm-hmm. werewolves and they're getting eaten off one by one. Oh, Horror, yeah. God. so <sighs> evocative. So incredible. Uh, and and when he and Luthien go into the uh, Aang Band. Yeah. Aang Band. Um, Aang Band. That's not, that's not how. Anyway. And, and, there's all this horrible, <laughs> then there's all this horrible stuff. And it's like so creepy and, and tense. Uh, like, the, you know, he's getting at something very, very primal is not the right word. But, but like very visceral. Visceral, let's say. And... Yeah, I totally, I think he's right on the money there. Yeah, I really appreciate how how much time he spends arguing. Um, Not precisely that fairy stories aren't just for children, because, Mm -hmm. I mean, that's an argument that was won a long time ago, I feel like, in Mm -hmm. in some ways. I mean, people still are like, fantasy, that's just for nerds, which is kind of just the same way of saying it's it's for children. Anyway, where he's like, they're not, they're not a different species. Mm -hmm. Like, Mm -hmm. you can, Mm -hmm. they don't. It's not that, oh, children love fairy stories because they're so credulous and all that. He's like, they're not, not even all kids love fairy stories. Like, I did, but most, not even most kids, but a lot of kids just like them because they're the only thing they're being given. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So I, I was like, okay, okay, yeah, this is, yeah, what does your child want? Give your child what they want to read and not what you think they should read. Uh, yeah. That was, how enlightened coming from the 30s. Like, right? You know? Yeah. <laughs> Truly. <laughs> Uh, there is, there is one thing that kind of leapt out to me. I think it's the section on escape where he's, Mm -hmm. Oh yeah. 
that's such a that's a good section where Godwin's law comes into play, and he's like, <laughs> all of a sudden, he's comparing people to he's comparing people to, to who misuse right. it. To, yeah. yeah, it was like, oh, that escalated quite quickly. <laughs> <laughs> he had thoughts, <laughs> uh, but Ned, what did, what were you going to say about well, escape? Well, <laughs> to, to my mind, uh, a passage that uh, you know th- th- this is something that uh, I think ties into yeah, actually what Jared was just saying. The idea is sort of like, yeah, why are you reading that? Only nerds read that, or things like this. Whatever, whatever attitudes we may have, we may have experienced or maybe imagined <laughs> as we were identifying uh, what we what we worked uh, what worked for us in reading, and that's the. Uh, and then so it's talking about when he talks about escape, the idea that uh, the idea that you are escaping from the world you're in into something else. I thought his uh, I thought his take on it, while again it was very you know bring on the capital letters for a lot of these terms, <laughs> and uh, sure. and certainly you know and basically just right before that mention of the Fuhrer and the Reich that you were talking about, uh, that distinction that he draws I thought was was pretty great. So uh, here is uh, here is the key sort of passage there, in what the misuse of escape are fond of calling real life, escape is evidently as a rule very practical and may even be heroic. In real life, it is difficult to blame it unless it fails. In criticism, it would seem to be the worse, the better it succeeds. Evidently, we are faced by a misuse of words and also by a confusion of thought. Why should a man be scorned if, finding himself in prison, he tries to get out and go home? Or if, when he cannot do so, he thinks and talks about other topics than jailers and prison walls? (laughs) Tolkien, abolition. Uh, uh, The world outside has not become less real because the prisoner cannot see it. In using escape in this way, the critics have chosen the wrong word. And what is more, they are confusing, not always by sincere error, the escape of the prisoner with the flight of the deserter. (laughs) I thought that was a really interesting distinction. Yeah. And uh, and just very applicable to today. Like uh, you do see people a lot being going, why why are you tweeting about a TV show when the the world is ending and it's like because because the world is ending i'm tweeting about a television show right <laughs> Yeah, no, agreed. Yeah. yeah, I thought I thought that was a, it's just basically an argument for basically that the mind is not, you know, is not always thinking about one key thing or or, or yeah. just, you know, the 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 x equals x, you know, it, it can be as simple as the quotidian stuff, um which I think has relevance to the story we're about to talk about too. Mm-hmm. So, uh, but the idea that it's not just simply the roof over your head, uh where you get your crust, uh if you have a place to sleep, the people you if you're young enough and are stuck on a fifth of their terrible family, whatever it is. I mean, he's not spelling all that out here, mm. but I think he's basically arguing. It's sort of like, look, you know, why? Why is this surprising, and why is this seen as bad? And and I think that distinction between uh, between the escape of the prisoner and the flight of the deserter is uh, is really <laughs> that's loaded in very interesting ways. I mean, you could take that many mm-hmm. different directions, but I, I like the fact that he does draw that distinction. Sort of the idea that the one is one is recognizing, well, this is it. And I will let my mind go free, so at least there's something. Versus, ah, I'm out <laughs> and mm-hmm. running away. So I like that. I I might be misremembering the organization of the essay, but I, in my memory, he segues right from that to talking about one of the functions of this escape, which is not actual escape, mm-hmm. but to be able, like you're tired of looking at the world, you go read a fantasy book or whatever, mm-hmm. and then you, when you come out of it, you your mind has been refreshed. You're able to see see the trees differently, that kind of thing. And yeah. I thought that was like, yeah, yeah that's, yeah, that's how I feel when I read a really good book. Like, it leads to recovery. Like, yeah. 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 And he, he, he sort of gets, you know, you could you could call it Luddism, but he, there, he moves from there in the passage talking about ah, people who celebrate factories and motor cars and things but like, like that. I'm kind of with him on that. Because we see, like, I, you know, I, not, I, I'm not disagreeing. <laughs> I totally. It is fascinating to see someone make a very similar argument to like what I see being made by a lot of urbanists today, including mm. myself. We don't have to live like this, like right. we, we. But there are a large number of people who think it's amazing to bring these very noisy pollution emitting uh machines into our living spaces, and that sucks. I love uh, I love that. It is interesting to me that he that Tolkien really does not care for drama or the visual arts uh 
But when I think that like Hayao Miyazaki is his spiritual successor in pretty much every way, <laughs> I was rewatching Ponyo the other day and was like, this is a great fairy tale. It's a, it's just, it's so, and like all of, all of his films are, they're these gorgeous, they, they aren't talking down to you. They aren't over explaining things, but you are in this immersive secondary world that you are believing in while the story is happening. So it's kind of a shame that he didn't get to see like spirited away. <laughs> I think he, yeah. I think he actually might have changed his mind about, about certain things. I don't could, know. Could have been. So well, I there... wonder what he would have thought of like fantasy filmmaking. I mean, there were a few that were out yeah. at the time. Like it, they've always been around, but like, did he, he did he doesn't talk about movies at all. Yeah. You know, he hated Disney. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I'm like, I, I totally see why, because it is very sanitized, even more so than, than Hans Christian Andersen did. So I, I totally see that. Let's go ahead and shift to the uh, the shorter side of a tree and leaf here, and that would be Leaf by Nigel itself, which is, of course, very thing. So, well, I want to throw it to the person who was raised Catholic here. How'd you think about that portrayal of purgatory there, Ariana, and everything <laughs> like that? So I was like, doctrine. <laughs> really, really, it was so fun reading it uh i had not read it before and like immediately going oh wow this feels very c.s lewis ish yeah uh, very, like i think more than he would ever care to admit uh <laughs> it was so catholic <laughs> i was like having having flashbacks to my ccd classes although mine i i feel like my church was weirdly not as horrible as 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 some of them were in terms of like frightening children with stories of hell and and purgatory it was it was a a certain it was a type of purgatory that like wasn't actually what i had been taught in it's not sunday school but ccd which is fascinating I mean, to my mind, the thing that exists, the whole thing is, I don't say obviously, but pretty closely, obviously, Tolkien's sort of apology for himself, sort of like, ah, you know, or is there some part yeah. of him that idealizes himself <laughs> as the, the, the artist off on his own going like, let me work on the thing, but I can't because real life is always uh, around me and keeps like, intruding. Yeah, and it, totally. It, it, it's, I like it because it's the struggle of, I think, a, you know, clearly believing has like, I know my duties to my fellow man and many things, but God. Gosh darn it. So I just want to work on my leaves. I've been there recently where it's like, oh, I should re- I should just text this person back, but I'm biz I ha I I simply cannot have texts in the morning. I feel like Reynolds Woodcock in, in Phantom Thread. <laughs> just like <laughs> This little, this little kind of piss baby. <laughs> boy, boy, I didn't expect we'd be going that route. I didn't either, but let's not play out that metaphor too much towards the end of the story. No, no, uh... no, no. It is, yeah. It does feel like it does kind of feel like him trying, him, him wrestling with himself. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And yeah, it it is funny how it is very C.S. Lewis like. Although in a way, in a weird way, it's kind of because Narnia wasn't for a few years later. So oh, no kidding, really? It, yeah, yeah. Because oh. Narnia is a fifties thing. This was written in nineteen forty five or published in nineteen forty five. Oh my originally. god! So that's what makes it kind of tricky. Um, when was the Great Divorce written? That's a good question. I don't know. We can check. C.S. Yeah. C.S. Lewis's book about. A Trip to Heaven and Hell, right? which I read at a very young age and was not a little terrified oh by. Oh, my gosh. Ah, Great Divorce came out the same year. Interesting. So he likely would have been aware of it, given you know, inklings and all that. I'm right, sure. given that they were sharing it, so there might have been that. I'm just checking on... It had a similar... Leaf by Nigel has a similar vibe to... Oh, you, well, okay, well, you know what else came out that year, sorry to interrupt, is that no, Hideous fine. Strength. And there's a... Oh. And for those who aren't aware of that title, uh, the the before um, before uh, the Narnia books, and I forget where Tilly at Faces, which is its own thing, which is a very great thing, I should note. Oh, uh, so out, good. Yeah, they're probably the best of his uh, fictive works, really, in the end. Uh, Lewis was was known for what was called the Space Trilogy, which is more an imaginative riff on space stuff. But and anyway, um, the final version of that was, uh, the final volume of that was That Hideous Strength, which also came out in 45. <laughs> the reason I bring that up is because that is the one that seemed to be a little less Tolkien-influenced, if you will, and more Charles Williams-influenced, mm-hmm. mentioning him well, again. And part of that is in the fact that it's a partially a, you know, particularly religious social satire of England in its own way at the time. Elements of that are definitely in place in this 
story too, which is interesting because mm-hmm. Tolkien was not necessarily a fan. He enjoyed Williams as a person. He contributed to uh, that uh, tribute volume for him, but he didn't. He did, wasn't really locked into his approach writing wise. But uh, in a weird way, I got a little tiny sense of how Lewis was interpreting Williams in some of the stuff, really towards the end of the tale with all the bureaucrats and things like that going on, but also some of the other elements too throughout the story. So it's one of those just odd little skew with moments. I mean, who knows what the exact connection is. I've not read the the standalone uh, version of the story with Tom Shippey's essay, so I can't be sure. Uh, there may be more information there. But I mean, it's um, funny to, to go on. I, I just a little aside about that hair strength. It is the I mean, it's the least Tolkienian in a way of the space trilogy, but it does make so many overt references to Numenor. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> Constantly misspelled. <laughs> oh my god. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So it's and it, and he'll, he even puts a footnote in at some point, like those who wish to know more about Numenor will have to wait for the writings of my good friend to come out. And it's, yeah, <laughs> he was right. He had to wait ten years, yeah. but he was oh right. Oh my god. <laughs> yeah. So anyway. There, it's a it's a classic case. On the one hand, it is a it, it it is a it is a nicely moral tale for grownups about you still got to do right by people is mm-hmm. what it is. I mean, that's mm-hmm. really the sort of the you know it's and what's nice about it is Nigel is not portrayed as a heroic or a totally nice figure. He's someone who grouses and complains. Mm-hmm. I like that about him. You know, he is somebody yeah. who is who is clearly like Ugh, and all that. So dealing with stuff. Hashtag relatable. Yeah, yeah. just. That, that it has to dig down, and it is the function when he finds himself in purgatory uh, to basically show that the part of him that was, you know, that sort of worked through it, quite literally, and also the fact that he was able to show generosity to Parrish when, for a time there, he seemed to be more resentful of it. It's one of those things that, on the one hand, it's a moral lesson being demonstrated. Again, is it published in a Catholic journal? We get that. But you step it aside, he's basically sort of arguing, basically saying, like, look, you may, and that's the key end of the story, too. And again, when Consider was written in 1945, he's written The Hobbit, yes. He's still waiting through and doing revising Lord of the Rings. He has no idea how that will be received. His larger legendarium is essentially unknown. <laughs> um, you know, he's, his academic stuff is a little side things, but that's it. And he has no idea at this point at all if his work's going to be known or discovered or anything like that, um, you know, when he eventually takes his journey uh, and, and all that. So it's an interesting portrayal of an artist at the time. It's sort of like, I, you know, this may have all been for in this world for nothing. Mm-hmm. And yet, what is this you know, consolation of philosophy in a weird sort of way? Uh, the <laughs> consolation that maybe after I die, this vision in my head will be something that will be possibly granted to me. A selfish wish, perhaps. But at the same time, who can blame him? <laughs> yeah, I certainly know there's worlds in my head that it would be really cool to go on the long journey and and find that waiting for me at its end. That would be nice. I get it. And I think that's that's why, despite being a very overtly Catholic work, it still works, you know, if you ha- you know are an atheist or mm-hmm. just don't care. Um, <laughs> it, it, it does still work because it, is, it does have like a very philosophical underpinning to it instead of a doctrinal underpinning, I guess. That yeah, sounds well, weird given be- that we were just talking about doctrine, but... Well, yeah, I mean, he spends time in purgatory, he gets to go to paradise and all that. But I do, like, at the end, when it switches back to real life or whatever, yeah. mm-hmm. like, the painting that he's been working on, this endlessly ramifying tree and leaves and things, what is it, like, a single scrap of it is all that remains? Yep. And they put it in a museum, and some, like, one guy is like, this is so cool, I love this, I, I can't, can't stop thinking about it. Yeah. And then that's where it ends, it's like he made a difference to one person with his art and even that didn't last it burns down and you know it yeah. just it doesn't still doesn't survive it's uh you know it, it's a kind of coaching reminder uh sort of like you know every artist wants to be remembered forever especially as time goes on and more and more you know the canon keeps growing as it were and things like mm-hmm. that but it's sort of the idea is like you can't predict what'll happen and yeah that's that's not that shouldn't be the impetus for your art mm-hmm. like Yes, of course, you want it to have impact. Usually, I don't like that word, but I think it actually does work here. It's impactful. Uh, <laughs> um, but you do, you know, obviously, you do want your work to have uh, an impact and hopefully a lasting one, but you should make things because you just want to make them. Yeah. I also just find it interesting that uh, not quite out of nowhere, there is context given that basically the idea is that Parrish has also 
clearly died and left earlier of this world than his wife has. But then Niggle and Parrish basically settle down their nice little domestic home together yeah. and just yeah. design them. Yeah, that. I got to that part and I was like, really? Because <laughs> yeah. I, I read this years ago and totally forgotten everything except the tree painting. Yeah. Mm-hmm. But I got to that and was like, I, okay. I, mm-hmm. <laughs> I guess this is, I mean, it's talking, so of course there's going to be a long term romance. <laughs> yes. They're roommates. They're roommates. Yeah, they were roommates. And like the wife is never even on on stage as it were nope. it's just like the two guys she's like she, there's one dialogue point between the two of them between his wife and her and and Parrish and his wife at one point but that's about it and that's all we yeah. really yeah. know about her but, yeah, and okay. and yeah it's sort of like they basically oh let's build a house together and it's only like when it's time for like Niggle to move on and Parrish's like oh I need to wait for my wife and I'm like is this the first time you even thought about her right? <laughs> in like you know, 20 years <laughs> so. how does how does time move here wouldn't be a Tolkien story without a gay couple heading off to paradise together. Right? <laughs> mm-hmm, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. It's just fascinating. And then the idea of it being called Niggles Parish at the end and all that. You know, yeah, yeah, I mean, yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Well, well. <laughs> so it's it's fascinating. Having said that, having said that, I really do think it's interesting, especially in the context of what we were talking about with On Fury Stories, when he's talking about other pieces of art, that he's basically put it in into the scope of a visual artist rather than a writer. It's not a writer yeah. about a writer. It's a writer about an artist. And in a way, that allows him sort of the get-out clause because he's trying to describe something in words that he probably knew himself as, of course, a visual artist, which he also was, that he maybe was never able to resolve the way he wanted it to. So it's like, maybe I can portray it better this way. And you let your imagination take over what the tree in the landscape is, in fact, supposed to look like. And certainly the way I used to think of it now is sort of like I thought of it differently when I was reading the story now. Sort of like, okay, how would I imagine this? What what goes into this? You know, it's sort of like on the one hand, he's detailed about what the tree and the landscape is, and on the other hand, you can take it so many other different directions. It's yeah. uh, it's really just kind of weirdly fascinating um, in a good way. It is funny that Tolkien definitely did not suffer from aphantasia because yeah. <laughs> seeing him talk about it, it's like, yeah, I know it's not like super common, but. Some people have difficulty forming images in their mind, professor, (laughs) from text. And I just find it just very interesting, too, that, uh, you know, it's a very English thing, I think, to turn the whole metaphor of death into a train journey. I re- that resonates with me a lot. I, I love trains. All I want to do is take trains. Mm-hmm. Yeah. <laughs> And I do like the idea that, you know, again, it's a it's a it's not a godless universe, but it's a hierarchicalist universe for for something that's a for the faith where it's sort of like the idea is the hierarchy. No priesthood, nothing. <laughs> it's just simply you're going on a journey. You better be yep. ready. And it turns out it wasn't quite ready. So he has to spend some time elsewhere. But that's it. <laughs> yeah. It's just, you know, they have, you have the voices who are basically are sort of like, hey, were you listening in? You know, but that's about <laughs> it. So it's just really fascinating to me how even in something like this, even in his most explicitly religious story, mm-hmm. he basically avoids <laughs> anything to do with organized religion as he himself knew it and learned about it and was brought up in that. It's it's, it's fascinating how it just is sublimated entirely. Yeah. And and as I mentioned in the introduction, like the closest we ever get to a priest character in any of his in any of his uh, stories, pretty much is the parson of from a jealous I am. And he's basically just sort of like, hey, I'm your friendly neighborhood info source here. <laughs> so <laughs> like, OK, <Yeah. laughs> kind of nuts. There it is. Well, well, uh, I'll just quickly note, uh, too, that if you're interested in reading Tree and Leaf again, you can and probably should um, at least do just, you know, if not buy, at least check it out somewhere. You can, as I mentioned, the two individual stories are in separate in their own editions. The current most recent uh, paperback edition uh, contains two extras, which we didn't talk about because that would sort of pile onto it. One is the poem Mythopoeia, which I won't go into, but it does have connections with on fairy stories and C.S. Lewis and all that. And, you know, it's a nice little addendum. If, however, you read the version of Tree and Leaf, which also has, and I'm going to pronounce this name totally wrong, The Homecoming of Bjornoth, um, that has nothing to do with Tree and Leaf as it stood. That is a very interesting, separate creative act by Tolkien that was turned into a radio play uh, that is based on Old English history. It really deserves attention. We'll probably talk about it sometime, but more in the context of his Old English scholarship, because that's clearly what this is about. It's sort of thrown in here, sort of like, oh, by the way, here's an addendum. So if you're reading it going like, what does this have to do with the other two stories? It doesn't. <laughs> so just, just sort of a heads up there. So it is a very interesting little uh, uh, just bit of a uh, story in Tolkien's own creative life, that's for sure. So I have nothing more to add right now, even though we could unpack more of what's going on in that incredibly dense essay <laughs> sure, that, but, sure. but i think i think we've talked 
a good amount, and we've had a long week, as you said. So, <laughs> any, any final thoughts on either of these, or before we wrap it up? They're well worth reading. Yeah, yeah see if you can make I it didn't through. I did enjoy Leaf by Nagel because I like like Tolkien. I'm not a big fan of allegory, so I was like, mm. okay, this is fine. But on fairy stories, even though I struggled with it, is like it's it's really good. It's 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 as, it has it's, its points. <laughs> it's it's as close as you're ever going to get to an organized, even as it's sprawl, vision of what Tolkien was trying to do and how he thought of mm-hmm. what he was trying to carry out on a very broad level and what he was arguing for um, with what Lord of the Rings turned out to be in particular. And uh, and you know, you know, you're you're not going to you, know, you. There are the letters. There are many other things and all that. But it's kind of nice to have a sort of like a core sort of here's my vision. Here's what I'm trying to do and mm-hmm. uh, and you can just read a lot out from that Okay, so now it's time to look ahead to the next episode. The choice of topic has come around to Oriano. What are we talking about next time? We're we're going to have a nice time talking about the Shire. Uh, oh, okay. We're going to talk okay. about its function in the story, influences on it, and the influence it clearly had on later works, mm-hmm. uh, how mm-hmm. it looks in the movies and mm-hmm. other portrayals, uh, its governing <laughs> <laughs> slash not uh, what that says <laughs> about the author, you know, is it supposed to be as idyllic as people kind of remember it after reading? And uh, yeah, we're just we're just going to chat about about home, you know, Aww. sure is Shire talk. It'll be a good thing. Yeah. So. yeah. <laughs> All right. I, I think we need that. Let, let's go to something idyllic and bucolic, seemingly. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> so, yeah. Right. <laughs> but what is the truth? Oriana will let us at least in the way. Well, that'll be great. So that'll be along to you next month. And, uh, you know, if if we remember when they do Amazon does news drops, they may yet do something this month to get surprises. I, don't know. I think so. Like usually there's two big events, I guess there's one in January and one in July. It's called the television critics association press tour. It's still happening, even though it's uh, I think remote now, but I think the January one is still too early. I think it, it'll be like July will be like mm. the big uh, release of stuff to to television mm-hmm. journalists. Maybe not, though. I don't know. We'll, we'll see. see. So, <laughs> well, I do know, okay, so they, you know, Wheel of Time wrap up, but also they're about to, like, you know, final episode of The Expanse is coming up, so it's sort of like, we've yeah. cleared decks. <laughs> mm-hmm. Amazon could be calculating, you never know. But who knows what's happening with the with the company, with the dude who's running around being photographed with all the scantily clad women or whatever the hell he's doing these God. days. Bezos! <laughs> you know, we can, we can go on. Let's, 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 not, let's not go there. So, anyway, <laughs> <laughs> I do it up. You call it pastoral. Yeah, yes. exactly. Yeah, we're Anything having a but nice him. Time. <laughs> we're having a nice time in the Shire. And we will indeed. And that'll be next time. So we look forward to you coming back and giving us a listen then. As always, thank you very much for listening uh, to the latest episode here. We really appreciate it. All feedback welcome. Please stay safe and uh, keep yourselves together as we make it through this year. And yeah, just eight months to go and we'll see something. Oh my <laughs> so God. We'll, we'll hear something. Something will happen. Who knows? <laughs> so uh, until then, but also until next month and next time in general, we will see you. Until then. Thanks again for listening to this episode of By the Bywater. Please subscribe and rate us via your favorite podcast listening options. Episodes and show notes are at megaphonic.fm slash by the bywater, all one word. You can also message us through here. Email us at by the bywater at megaphonic.fm or follow us on Twitter at by the bywater. You can also follow us individually on Twitter and ask questions there. I'm at Vandroid Helsing. I'm at Schwinter, S-C-H-W-I-N-D-T-E-R. And I'm Ned Raggett, two G's, two T's. By the Bywater is a proud member of Megaphonic Podcast Network. Find all our fancy little shows at megaphonic.fm. We hope you join us again next time. Until then, Namarie. Namarie.